On behalf of Cambridge Innovation Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Atom, I'd like to welcome you to the versatile Leapian Transposase platform, applications in high titer bispecific antibody production and next generation cell therapies. My name is Elizabeth Lamb and I'm the host and technical director for this event. Now I would like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Oren Beska. PhD, Amalgamator of Business and Biology with Atom. Our second presenter is Nicholas Marshall, PhD, Senior Director, Protein Sciences in Venra. Welcome, Dr. Marshall and Dr. Beska. The webinar is yours. Well, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction. And thank you for joining us here today, Nick, uh, to talk about your platform as well. Well, as you know, today what we're going to talk about is really focusing on the Leap in Transposase platform and how this has been applied to bispecific and multispecific uh, types of molecules, uh, and more specifically today, the Invenra platform. Before we jump into that, though, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to, to Adam and the platform that we've developed over the last few years, um, and then hand it over to Nick as, as, as we move forward. What you may or may not be aware of is that Adam was founded uh, actually 20 years ago um, as DNA 2.0, and some of you may have interacted with us back in those days. We are the same company, just rebranded as we were looking to move our technologies above and beyond uh, the gene synthesis platforms we had developed. We're about 150 employees now, and as you see on the right-hand side of this screen, um, we're very focused on innovation. Um, we, we have well over 30 issued patents, uh, 50, 60 plus peer reviewed papers by Adam authors and our services and our technologies have now been in nearly 3000 publications in the last 20 years. Uh, just as a reminder, fundamentally, we are a CRO uh, that uses um, you know, our, our technologies and our platforms and leverages this for, um, for biotechnology discovery and development. Uh, historically, as I mentioned, we are a gene synthesis provider and we have a lot of uh, IP and interesting solutions in the gene synthesis and vector construction space. We do protein production and analytics and have continued to expand our capabilities there from high throughput 96 well platforms all the way through to hundreds of grams for, for our customers and analytics from all the various types of column based analytics, gels, capillary electrophoresis, mass spectrometry, etc. We're also a protein engineering shop. Fundamentally, we were built on um, the desire to engineer novel attributes into proteins. Of course, one of those happens to be the transposase platform we'll be talking about today, but we've also been using machine learning and traditional design, build, test, learn cycles over the last 20 years um, for our customers in, in developing novel proteins and, um, and applications. And then finally, of course, is the Leap in Transposase platform, which we'll spend most of the time on today. And just as an initial um, note, we do provide this platform as a service to our customers. So you can contract us to do work. And we also out license this um, if for you to use in your labs. And just as a reminder, really, again, focused on the, on the science, focused on innovation. And uh, as a service company, of course, we're nothing without uh, our customers and servicing them and their needs as they develop products uh, in the industry. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll switch a little bit here to the platform itself. Um, the platform itself has three fundamental pillars. Uh, one of them we call Gene GPS, or this ability to optimize the open reading frames, the codons, how these are used uh, by the cell to express proteins. And again, roughly 20 years of experience in this space. Of course, outside of the genes themselves, the vector and the vector components that we've been developing again for, for a long time. And in this case, obviously, uh, today's topic optimized around mammalian cell expression and specifically uh, CHO cells. And of course, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we do engineer proteins. And of course, the transposase is a protein, it's an enzyme, and all taken together incorporate the Leap in Transposase platform. There is one more key component to this platform that's not on this slide. Of course, this is the fundamental kind of composition of matter that gives rise to this platform. But really, at the end of the day, it's the team and the experience for the last five years. How do we apply 
our gene GPS? How do we apply our vector sets? How do we apply the knowledge base that we've built in protein expression across the years to solve these problems? And again, today, really focusing on the complexities of multi-specific antibodies. So when you hear about transposase platforms and these types of platforms over the, the last few years, they've become quite chic, if you will, quite um, uh, coming more prevalent in the industry. We hear a lot about the transposase itself and people talking about having a particular transposase based platform. But what I'd really like the audience today to think about more so than a transposase is actually the cognate piece to that enzyme. The enzyme itself is not the key component of these platforms, but rather the transposon. That is that piece of DNA that the transposase is putting into the genome, that piece of DNA that includes the gene GPS and the vector GPS components, that piece of DNA, of course, that, that, that contributes to the robustness and, and um, the, the final cell lines that, that will be creating these manufacturing platforms. So how do these uh, technologies work? What's the mechanism of action by which these transposase move these pieces of DNA around? Well, I'm gonna actually simplify this quite a bit for the sake of time and, and try to um, put this into as few words as possible. Simply put, it's a cut and paste mechanism. The enzyme cuts the DNA from one place and it puts it into a new location. It is not a copy in place. There's no polymerase activity. There's no point mutations that can happen because of lack of fidelity. Fundamentally, the enzyme cuts a piece of DNA. The DNA itself is called a transposon and it puts it into a new location. That's all you need to know about the detail of the mechanism. It's quite simple. But what does this mean as we apply it to biotech and building Cho, Cho cell lines? The transposon, of course, is put inside an expression plasmid. The transposon is characterized uh, by having inverted terminal repeats or ITRs that flank the expression cassette in the middle, which of course contains the gene of interest and all the regulatory elements. You'll also see this tetranucleotide motif, TTAA, flanking these ITRs as well. That TTAA, it will be the target site inside the Cho chromosome uh, as well. And what you see here, of course, is the transposon that we want to move into the Cho chromosome. What's missing here is the transposase enzyme, the leap-in enzyme, which is co-transfected with the plasmid as a messenger RNA, translated into the active enzyme, and you get the cut of the transposon out of the plasmid, the pasting of that piece of DNA in the new chromosomal site. The plasmid is recircularized, degraded, and now you have stable integration of the transposon with the gene of interest, the regulatory elements into the chromosomal target site. Of course, the enzyme is only transiently expressed and it's gone within about 48 to 72 hours. So as you can see here, we get transient transposase expression, which means there's a unidirectional cut and paste from the plasmid into the chromosome. A single copy is placed in the chromosome with each turnover cycle of the enzyme. This uh, copy number can be titrated. And as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention on the next slide, um, the structural integrity of the transposon is maintained. This is a very, very high fidelity process. Whatever is in between the ITRs gets put directly into the chromosome. And in theory, and in fact, in practice, there is no size limitation. So what I'd like to really focus on on the next slide, um, uh, quickly before handing this over to Nick, is this notion of the structural integrity, this, this idea that there is little or no chance of having any mutations or rearrangements inside the transposon. So what, if you think about this in simplistic terms, an antibody, a heavy chain and a light chain, maybe a GS selection cassette, some promoters of interest, et cetera, you conceptualize this in your mind, you build it in silico, it gets made in the lab, you transfect it into your cells, and in tra traditional random integration formats, in the absence of a transposase mechanism, 
Sure, you do in fact get some of what you planned at the beginning, your, your, your expression cassette intact. But as we know, and as has been published for decades now, that's not all you get. You get truncations, you get deletions, you can get concatamers, scrambling. Anything with the GS selection marker will be selected. And hence the bulk pool that is selected in this random integration format is highly heterogeneous. It's not very consistent. It's not very predictive of your final clones. And of course, screening these pools for final clones becomes a very complicated, time-consuming and FTE-consuming task. And hence the reason many people try to go down the pathway of things like mini pools and, and, and other processes is to get around this complexity. Of course, this is something we view as being overly complex. And so the way we view this is you take that expression cassette of interest, you put ITRs, you rename it a transposon, you provide a cognate enzyme, and you get this inside the genome, this very, very consistent integration of your, trans, of your expression cassette into the genome, creating these highly uniform and highly predictive bulk pools, wherein the pools are very consistent, the pools are very predictive of the clones, and identifying high quality, high value, high expression clones is not a heroic task. This results in a very robust um, cell line development process uh, where you go from gene synthesis through to master cell banks, research and master banks quite quickly and robustly. Notably, the transposase enzyme and the mechanism happens right here during transfection. Again, it's probably about a 48 to 72 hour um, time period during which the cut and paste mechanism occurs. Everything gets put into the genome. You select out these bulk pools which again are highly representative and quite unique in their value. We'll talk a little bit today about, about some of these complex molecules that we make, wherein construct screening, different regulatory elements can be screened during bulk pools with the, with the um, confidence that what you see in the pools will be resulting in the clones as well. You can use the pools for process development as well as analytical development. And as we've seen during COVID and we're seeing more and more in non-COVID applications, bulk selected pools being used not only for talk slots, but also for clinical material generation. And so with that um, simple, relatively simple overview of the platform, I'll just remind you, it's a simple technology. It's a cut and paste mechanism. And fundamentally, it's what you paste into the genome that matters. And with that, we'll switch topics here to what I call the zoo of bispecifics. And it's not me that did it, of course, in this review about five years ago now, six years ago, um, you know, Brinkman and Contraman put together this zoo of bispecifics. And what we know unequivocally now is that chain ratio balancing in these complex molecules, absolutely critical, not only for titer, but also for product quality and robustness. Uh, in these more complex molecules. So with that introduction, hand it over here to Nick um, and uh, we'll move on with the uh, Inventor's B-Body platform. Nick. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and to start, I just wanted to say thank you to the Adam team uh, for the invite. Um, Inventor has been working with Adam now for several years um, and going on a couple of years now of cell line development across multiple programs uh, focused on bispecifics. Um, and just jumping right into acknowledgements, um, calling out uh, the, the Adam team, the Inventor team, the, the collaboration has been really phenomenal. Um, everybody involved clearly very focused on just doing great science, doing uh, uh, what we can to, 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 to advance both cell line development and the use of bispecifics uh, to enable some novel, a lot of novel biology. Um, so jumping into the presentation, next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about Invenra itself. Uh, we are a biotech located in Madison, Wisconsin, currently about uh, 80 employees. And we are focused on bispecific antibodies uh, and beyond that, multi-specific antibodies. Um, and we are a partner-driven company. 
So we are, are always looking for opportunities uh, to work with people who have novel uh, biology that they um, can really only enable through doing through using multi-specific antibodies. So uh, always looking for those um, excellent collaborative uh, partnerships. Next slide. Um, this is an, a very high level overview of what the B body by specific platform enables uh, from our perspective and applied across the process of drug discovery and development uh, up into the IND filing phase. So um, what do you want out of a by specific platform? Well, um, from our perspective, you want it to be flexible so that you can incorporate a, a wide variety of variable domains um, so that those variable domains can drive the biology and you're using the platform really to hold the pieces together in the way that you want. Um, we've uh, expressed in-house uh, thousands now of uh, bispecific antibodies over the last few years um, and our, we have a very high success rate probably verging into the 80 to 90 percent of getting variable domains put together um, to enable proof of concept studies um, to test that novel biology at the very early phase. Um, going into the bispecific discovery phase um, where you're um, trying to find the right combinations and the right orientations, you want to have a platform that doesn't require you to say reinvent expression and purification for every molecule. You have to do that on hundreds of molecules. It becomes very time consuming. So the B-Body enables um, us to use platform fit for purpose, transient expression, um, and one or two step uh, fit for purpose purifications uh, to move very rapidly through this space on, on many molecules. Um, going into lead optimization, uh, ideally what you screen for will be pretty close to what you want as a final drug molecule. And we've seen now on multiple programs that the, the need for um, extensive lead optimization, uh, it, it's, it's not needed with um, the B-Body platform. You can take what you get out of this screening phase and move that right forward into cell line development. Uh, cell line development, this is where Leapin uh, really, again, enables the multi-specific antibody uh, uh, um, field now. Uh, we'll talk about later the complexities of cell line development on multi-specific antibodies, but Leapin is uh, enabling that rapid pool generation, um, highly consistent clones, and in our cases, ex exceptionally high yields and titers of properly assembled heterodimer. Um, getting that cell line development done well uh, and quickly enables uh, process development to go very smoothly. Um, the B-Body platform we've seen is compatible with typical MAB-based downstream processing, so protein A purifications, cation exchange, uh, so on and so forth. So you aren't having to, to invent novel ways to just get your molecule out of culture. Um, when moving into preclinical and clinical, of course, you want something that has impeccable uh, safety and um, uh, pharmacokinetics. So IgG-like PK. Um, a lot of the different bispecific platforms struggle with this. B-Body, uh, we've seen excellent PK. Uh, high stability and clean toxicity uh, to 100 mg per kg. And all of this then drives towards that IND filing, making it as low risk as possible. Next slide. Okay, so um, hopefully everybody online is familiar with bispecific antibodies and what they, uh, the sorts of biology that they can enable, but just in case uh, uh, you're interested in that, quick example of what can be done. Uh, this is a program that Inventor has been working on with childhood neuroblastoma. So jumping into that, um, next slide please. There is a drug on the market um, called unituxin or dinatuximab that treats uh, uh, childhood neuro neuroblastoma. Um, in short, it's a very effective drug, but it has some 
very severe side effects. The, the top one being um, severe pain, uh, about 85% of patients. Um, this is quite problematic because a lot of the patients um, can't even withstand the full treatment regimen due to the, to the pain. So then they go off treatment and then recurrence and so forth. So next slide. What, what is causing this pain? Well, the pain is related to the mechanism of action. The target of the antibody is a glycolipid called GD2 that is highly expressed on neuroblastoma cells, but it is also prevalent on healthy peripheral nerve cells. So the antibody, it effectively treats the neuroblastoma, but in parallel, it has this off-target effect of hitting healthy nerve cells, generating a lot of pain. Um, so what bispecific antibodies allows for is that you can combine pairs of targets to then dramatically improve the specificity of a drug. Um, so in this example, neuroblastoma uh, tends to express two unique, uh, a unique pair of targets, in this case, B7H3 and GD2. And by combining those into a bispecific, you result with an AND gate. So now the drug really is most effective when both of those targets are present. And then um, in the case where only one target is pre present, you get um, a much better safety profile. Next slide. And you can see this in in vitro assays um, and uh, uh, in vivo as well, but uh, uh, the sort of upper left panel here is an example of uh, a cell line that's expressing both targets. Um, the black trace uh, in the graph is when you have an antibody where only the GD2 arm is present and you see no binding uh, on that cell because it's very weak binding. Um, the purple is with the other B7H3 target. So you do see binding, but it's weaker binding. And then when you have both targets present in the red line, you get uh, logs of uh, uh, shift in the EC50 to binding. Um, to sort of mimic the peripheral nerve cell, you have a cell line in the bottom left that only has the GD2, and you see clean uh, binding profile across uh, that cell. And then on the right-hand side is an actual human, human neuroblastoma line uh, where you see the same effect. Only in the presence of both targets do you get that those orders of magnitude shift in binding affinity and efficacy. Next slide. Okay, so you can enable some great biology by using bispecifics, but of course the challenge is, is bispecifics have, have, have often been difficult to make or have undesirable biophysical properties. Um, so uh, that's where the engineering for the bee body came in. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So Oren already showed this slide, one of, one of our favorite <laughs> papers as well, the, the zoo of different bispecific options out there. And all of these options can be very effective uh, for different indications, of course. Um, click one more time. So, but what Invenra has been focused on are specifically IgG-like bispecifics. So we want to be able to make drugs that um, uh, have the advantages of, bi of a bispecific, but additionally all the advantages of uh, a full IgG MAB, um, such as effector function, PK, so on and so forth. So click again, please. So we're gonna focus on uh, that with the B-body and one more click gives you the B-body itself. So all of these different platforms that are IgG-like have the same challenge in front of them. They have to, to, to solve the light chain pairing problem. If you throw um, two unique heavy chains and two unique light chains into a culture together, and just express them, you're gonna get a statistical distribution of all of the possible combinations uh, that then makes purification a challenge. So we have to be able to drive that specific assembly to get high yield of the desired product. Next slide. Okay, so um, again, what are the ideal features for a bi-specific platform from our perspective? 
Um, one, we want to be able to move quickly through the discovery phase, um, and we want to be able to incorporate a lot of um, different VHVL pairs into our um, molecules so that we can let the, the biology drive the decisions uh, versus, you know, what works as a bispecific. Um, so to date, I mentioned we've, we've done thousands of bispecifics from many different sources, including humanized uh, antibodies, humanized mice, um, phage-derived uh, variable domains, um, uh, ones directly from human, uh, and also all of these different sources you can sort of mix and match. So one side is from one source, the other side is from a different source. Um, Beyond that, being able to move through uh, screening quickly. So uh, being able to assay the exact molecule that you will want to move forward into preclinical and clinical is an advantage. It, it eliminates a lot of risk associated with having to change formats. Um, I want it to be compatible with high throughput screening and um, ideally one step or fit for purpose purification methods that can go straight into an assay. Um, so we, uh, the bee body is quite amenable to that. Um, we use all in the early phase fit for purpose, uh, expression, transient expression, purification, but then, uh, next step, which is going to be most of the focus of this talk from here on out is this efficient, predictable CMC. So targeting high titers, uh, high yield of the, uh, desired heterodimer, um, compatible with standard downstream pot processing, and of course, impeccable biophysical and PK uh, characteristics. So yep, focus on that. And then next slide, please. This is the design of the bee body. Um, it is driven through heterodimerization using the standard clinically validated knob into hole uh, FC framework. Um, and then uh, the fab arms in order to drive that specific light chain pairing is accomplished through a domain swap. So uh, you can see on the upper left of the diagram, um, we have taken the CH3 domain that's usually found in the FC and repurposed it as a fab domain, um, constant domain. Um, and then specifically engineered the interface of that novel uh, domain now um, to uh, pair with itself versus cross-talking with the CH3 in the, in the uh, FC domain. There's a series of um, uh, engineered disulfides that help accomplish that and then, and then um, interface en engineering as well. Um, on the other side of the molecule, uh, entirely in blue, it's a standard fab-like domain, um, but we reverse the orientation of the CH1 and CL. Reason for that is, one, um, we like using CH1-based uh, purifications in the early phase. Um, having the CH1 on the outside gives us higher uh, percentages of fully assembled in the discovery phase that we can isolate quickly. Uh, and empirically, we saw that that orientation gave us better yield as well. So uh, next slide. Of course, the challenge with the engineering was, as I stated already, um, this needing to avoid the crosstalk between now having multiple CH3 domains in the same molecule. So much of the work was focused on um, finding specific mutations that would drive the desired pairing on the bottom and avoid the sort of concatamer uh, problematic pairings on the top. So um, just very briefly walking through that, um, we were able to uh, incorporate the novel disulfide, which immediately gives you a, a pretty decent um, uh, uh, percentage of correctly assembled uh, based on the, the main peak you see in these um, size exclusion traces. Uh, but then you tack in the um, additional interface en engineering mutations, which we only needed two additional mutations, and you can walk from 70% you know, of the proper molecule in this experiment up to nearly 100% um, right off the bat. 
Um, and these are, I've mentioned, a new class of mutations not related to knob and hole or charge pairs. Next slide. Okay, so great, we, we did the engineering, but it's an unnatural molecule. Uh, you've got to make sure that it isn't going to fall apart immediately or behave weirdly in vivo. So um, just as a quick example of that, uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, you see our um, uh, stability uh, studies. This goes out to four weeks. We have uh, shelf life stability studies out to six months now. Um, but this was just a nice data set to include. We did this at 100 mg per mil um, uh, under a few different formulations. Uh, and you can see really excellent stability frozen, um, four degrees, uh, 25 degree, and then um, very uh, uh, MAB-like stability even under the 40 degree accelerated uh, stability. Um, in the uh, pharmacokinetic space, uh, this data on the right shows data from Cinemologus up to 10 mg per, mi per kg. Um, uh, IgG-like uh, half-lifes of 10 to 12 days. Um, that translates to rodent very well as well. Um, and we've gone up to 100 mg per kg dosing with clean safety profiles. Next slide. Um, another uh, interesting feature here is uh, the ability to take this bispecific molecule and concentrate it down. So we've now done testing with several molecules um, with really limited formulation studies as well, um, where we have concentrated the molecule down, looked at the viscosity as a unit of um, uh, concentration, seen that you can go to greater than 200 mg per mil and still be under filtering processing limits. Um, and then uh, another nice piece of data is uh, up to around 170 mg per mil um, under the viscosity limits for subcutaneous dosing. So that is, from our perspective, very um, uh, enabling, very unique in the bispecific space that uh, you can use now this advanced, more compl complex bispecific molecule and even do subcutaneous dosing. Um, uh, so, yeah. so next slide, please. Um, lastly, just the sort of desired features of the bispecific is that while it's an unnatural molecule, it isn't highly immunogenic. Um, so doing a study with uh, depleted PBMC uh, cells here. Um, you have positive controls of this ATR107 and KLH that are known to be quite immunogenic. Um, trastuzumab, which is a well-studied uh, drug um, with known Im immunogenicity profile, uh, and you see that the, the B body construct that we used here uh, has very comparable uh, immunogenicity levels in this in vitro assay to, to, to known clinically proven entities. Next slide. All right, so now getting into the, the cell line development part itself. So the statement here is, you know, we, we, we believe that the, the B body is an excellent bispecific platform. Um, a, a, a bad platform will obviously present challenges in cell line development. So even if you have a great cell line development platform, uh, but a bad bispecific platform, you're going to run into challenges. Likewise, a, a, a bad cell line development platform can take a great platform uh, like the bee body and present then challenges in cell line development. So this is where bringing together leap in and the bee body from our experience has been a phenomenal combination. So go ahead to the next slide. So what are some of the challenges in cell line development for four chain bispecifics? Really what it comes down to is when you go from two chains, heavy chain, light chain, to three chains or four chains or five chains or beyond, um, it, it's just each new chain is in, increasing that level of complexity almost, uh, probably exponentially. So as, as Oren um, pointed out already, the random incorporation uh, methodologies um, get very, very challenging because you're getting inconsistent incorporation of, of the, the open reading frame into the genome. 
Um, and what we've seen also is that th th those, those methods are often done iter iteratively and we have a construct that is inherently unnatural. So can um, cause some toxicities if the, if the um, paired chains are not there together. So trying to put them all in one at a time becomes very problematic. Um, also, uh, mispairings can be misleading to your cell line development and um, uh, uh, harmful to the cells. Uh, and functionally, what it what it seems to translate to is that the number of colonies that you need, or the number of clones that you need to screen to get where you want, just goes up by orders of magnitude as you increase the number of chains. Um, so uh, that targeted transposase high incorporation of the open reading frames is what really enables um, uh, bispecific technology to move through cell line development effectively and rapidly. Um, one of the other challenges which wanted to call out because this is where the, the scientific team on these projects has really uh, shined is on um, uh, understanding the possible product-related impurities. One of the other complexities of bispecifics in this format is that you have a symmetric molecule where you want a heterodimer, but if you only use a gel to screen colonies, for example, or a protein A titer, you have possible product-related impurities that look the same as the product you want. So, um, the project team here and Adam in particular uh, really hit it out of the park in terms of thinking about the structure, thinking about methods that we could use to rapidly screen colonies, get where we needed to be, and 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 ensure that what we're selecting out is our desired drug. Next slide. So this is an example from our our first really project. Uh, working in cell line development with Adam. It's the example because it's the most advanced as well. So on the left, you see our clonal selection strategy, um, very typical. So um, we were culturing the clones, uh, we measured titers. We used titering based on multiple different parameters. So protein A and CH1, which gives us a couple of pieces of the molecule that we can monitor. And then additionally, um, looking at um, different moderate throughput uh, uh, separation methods, HPLC based, to get an idea to make sure that it's the heterodimer that we're, we're following. So um, the, the other thing that I want to point out here is, again, is to Oren's point that consistency in clones uh, in terms of uh, viability, cell density, and then at the bottom plot there, the tighter um, uh, based on multiple parameters that we were seeing from clones. So um, this is a snapshot of clones, of course, but you can see when you have such a high success rate in your clones, how that translates into a really high quality pool ahead of that. So at this phase, we were able to isolate clones um, that were from fed batch culture unoptimized, giving six, seven gram per liter and you know, 70 plus percent um, of our properly assembled product. Next slide. That then of course was taken into uh, production. We worked with a, another partner, CDMO, um, to uh, move this into a uh, uh, GLP talk slot. The partner we chose uh, has a platform based on perfusion. So um, the tighter numbers and such are based on a perfusion-based uh, platform. Um, but the bottom line is, is that then again, those clones translated into, um, again, robustly high titers um, and, and good product quality right out of the bat. Um, uh, and uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought briefly. Okay, but uh, in, in the end, we were able to, uh, uh, develop a process that uh, produced significant quantities of material and the process recoveries were in the 40 to 60% range, which is uh, quite good. Um, this was our first program. This particular molecule um, uh, uh, is actually on the low side for our initial product quality numbers. So more uh, later stage programs are uh, 
more in the 80% range and the process yields are much higher. Next slide. Okay, so to sum up, um, the B body platform uh, and its advantages for bispecific antibodies, again, reiterating the, the challenges in the bispecific space uh, of low yields, uh, unstable product, uh, improper chain pairing, uh, all of those things are, from our perspective, really addressed by the by the, the B body platform. Um, tack on to that then the, the leap in uh, cell line development methods, and you get a really fantastic product um, right out of the gate, high yields uh, and, and high percentages of isolated drug in the end. Next slide. And what it all drives to then is in this space, when you do the protein engineering at the start, well, get a good platform and you apply really uh, fantastic cell line development methods with leap in transposase, it makes the rest up until IND uh, much more straightforward. So this is the high level of what we were able to um, implement to get to a phase one appropriate method. So um, by specific antibody where you're starting the purification with a protein A capture, so no exotic materials there. You do your uh, viral inactivation, standard methods, you move to a cation exchange, we had a mixed mode step in flow through that did the um, uh, uh, host cell protein removal and a final polishing and then into formulation. So combining these technologies, you need no exotic resins or uh, inventing new processes to get where you need to go. Robust process recoveries, demonstrated um, robustness in 50 liter perfusion and Again, as Warren already mentioned, that leap in uh, uh, speed to a, a good pool uh, in a, and clones in a very short amount of time. The other thing, again, that Warren already mentioned was the quality of the pools enabling the acceleration of programs. So we were able to, at the pool stage, um, start all of the process development and supply the preclinical studies from pools versus having to wait for clones. Next slide. So this is just the, the final study of, uh, or the final slide of basically everything that we talked about today. Um, so just to reiterate the high expressions, combining these, uh, these, these platforms, um, multiple formats that we've been able to use one by ones, two by ones, so forth. Um, incorporation of multiple uh, variable domains from different sources, uh, robust purifications, IgG-like pharmacokinetics, um, low immunogenicity comparable to known drugs. Uh, and uh, one thing that we didn't talk about much is the compatibility of the B-body with tunable FC characteristics. So we've evaluated uh, silencing the FC, afucosylation, of the FC to enhance effective function and half-life extension mutations, so on and so forth. So quite flexible from that regard. And I believe that's my last slide. Indeed it is, Nick, and thank you so much for that fantastic overview and um, some great data there. And so what I'll do is just take maybe one more minute to, to summarize uh, a few things from our perspective as well uh, as we then set up to take some questions. You know, as we've, what we've been talking about here so far is really how the platform has been used to express uh, different types of proteins um, and the flexibility inside that platform. But just to get you thinking about other ways to apply this, I mean, fundamentally, the platform is a genetic engineering tool above and beyond just expressing proteins. We've also created novel platforms here to also reduce the expression of certain proteins. And we've applied that to create a, a novel host cell line that's GS deficient. As uh, Nick mentioned, we're also involved in making um, afucosylated and hypofucosylated antibodies with increased ADCC. Happy to talk about that. We've also engaged in a, not a, a lot of custom and bespoke projects where we've been able to knock down some very interesting proteins that have resulted in um, desired 
product quality, but also tighter effects as well. And so the, again, the final slide here is just reminding you that this is a very versatile toolbox. Be creative, think about what you can do. Don't just think about one transposon, think about many and all the different things you might be able to do when you're looking forward to engineering uh, mammalian cells. And in this case, most specifically Cho cells. Platform's been around for a while. I won't go into the details here, but we've done a lot of projects. We have a, lot, a licensee, um, robust uptake on the licensee side as well. Uh, and in just about the last three and a half or so years, we've increased the number of regulatory filings to well over 20, 22 filings, something like this across three jurisdictions. And in the COVID space, we did get some rapid approval for phase two and phase three product made using the platform. As I mentioned, it's a very robust platform. This has been tech transferred uh, to approximately 13 or more CDMOs to date. So thanks for your time. And just a reminder that uh, we're a CRO. We're happy to do this in a fee-for-service mode or license it to your labs. And we do a lot more than just cell line development as well. So with that, I'll just say thank you for your time and happy to take any questions that have popped up uh, as a function of the webinar. There are several questions in the chat on the public page. Oh, great, thanks for that, Robin. I do see um, Elizabeth, question from Robin. Uh, I've seen a question here about using Leap In for, for transient um, production of material during the discovery phase. Um, uh, much like uh, they have it in Venra, we do have a fit for purpose transient process at Atom. Um, one that's currently not based on leap in, but does educate the vector design for leap in. And I'll also add that we are in fact pulling together now a process that does help us to use leap in in a semi-transient way. Of course, there are some integrations in the genome, so it's not completely transient. Um, but the answer is yes, we do have platforms both with and without leap in uh, that can be used in the discovery phase to help educate um, the vector design in the future. I see another question here about um, the bispecifics um, and uh, looking at yield and looking at different vector configurations. Um, as, as Nick mentioned, uh, not just with the B body platform, which did involve multiple vector configurations to get to the final outcomes. Uh, as you can imagine, not only ch varying chain ratios, but also the amount of each protein that's being made as a function of time can be very important in creating um, titers, but also product quality effects. Um, it's not uncommon for us to use, uh, you know, three to five, and in some cases, as many as 10 different vector sets, again, screened in the, in the stable pool set, uh, stable pool, um, platform in a way that allows us to, um, look at both tighter and product quality, um, as a function of different vector configurations. Yeah. And if, if I may add to that, Please. one of the big strengths here is the uh, ability to move quickly through that space and have those high quality pools right off the bat. So you can try several different configurations or ratios um, to really to really drive towards that high quality pool. Yeah, indeed. Th thanks, Nick. Um, one more question uh, pop, popping up here. I see you asked some questions about, um, you know, it looks like comparing some of um, these kind of enzymatic driven integration processes with random integration with respect to finding outlier pie in the sky, super, super high titer clones and things of that nature. Um, what I will say is we, we at Atom do not uh, do uh, R&D or optimization around random integration. Uh, what we do is optimize the platform for robustness um, and low risk and high titer, uh, as you've seen here, here today. What I can tell you is that uh, for many of our licensees that have come to Atom and in license the platform, Traditionally, they have been random integration platforms that they are comparing against. And in many cases, random platforms that they've optimized over many, many years. And what our licensees have told us is that time and time again, on average, they do see um, better titers coming out of the clones, better product quality coming out of the clones uh, using uh, the Leap In platform compared to their traditional random platform. Um, but I'll also add to that, 
extremely robust stability, right? Oftentimes these very, very high titer clones suffer in terms of both um, genomic phenotypic stability, but also expression uh, phenotypic stability. And the, the clones generated from the leap in platform are extremely stable. So although we don't see a lot of outliers and really, really high expressing outlying clones, as Nick referred to, we do see a lot of very good high titer clones that are extremely robust and from a manufacturing perspective, very, very low risk and extremely uh, stable in their expression. So I hope that answers uh, the question that came up there. I think as, as Elizabeth mentioned, I don't see many other questions coming up. Of course, we're available to answer any questions uh, that might come up as a function of time. Um, so if there are no other questions, maybe um, we, we can stop the webinar now and um, look forward to in, engaging with anybody who may have questions around our platform, of course, but the B-Body platform as well, a fantastic uh, bi-specific platform that uh, is you know, highly compatible with, with this cell line development. But as, as Nick has said, um, really focusing on the biology and solving, um, we believe, and obviously they believe some of these unique problems around uh, bi-specific IgG-like structured um, antibodies. Nick, any other parting comments? Uh, well, it looks like there's maybe another question that popped up real quick. You wanna hit that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, question about CAR T's and, and cell therapy. Um, yes, we do have experience here. It is, uh, in fact, the case, as you're no doubt aware, that this is a way of, of building cell therapies, um, both in T cells, in macrophages, and, and other types of platforms. We at Atom are developing processes to create, uh, optimizing those now. If you're interested in this, please send me an email. I'm happy to follow up with that and give you an update on our current status for applying the Leap In platform uh, to cell therapy applications. Um, absolutely something that we are working on uh, at Adam. And then from there, I just, again, reiterate, thank you for the invitation to, to talk again to get today. Um, as I mentioned, the collaboration between Inventor and Adam has been fantastic. So thank you all for the, the help th uh, through these cell line development programs. Absolutely, Nick, it's been our pleasure. And um, it's, it's uh, as you mentioned, it's been, been a couple of years and we've, we've um, enjoyed the collaboration as well. Double check if there's any other questions. I don't see any on my side, but uh, again, thank you everyone for joining. And um, for those of you who weren't able to make it, as Elizabeth mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is being recorded and uh, should be available um, for download and streaming uh, in the future. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, uh, Elizabeth, if, if you'd like to um, conclude. Thank you very much, Dr. Beska. And thank you, Dr. Marshall, for your presentations. I'd like to thank Atom, for sponsoring today's event. So on behalf of Cambridge Innovation Institute's Global Web Symposia series, I'd like to thank you all for coming. We appreciate your time and hope you were able to get some information that will make life in the lab a bit easier. <laughs> thank you all so very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.